sense of um, spatial sound that, uh, again, in mid-sentence, we, we had to uh, leave yesterday. This is Ry Cooter describing Robert Johnson's recording session. I think he was sitting in the corner, and I should explain before I finish the sentence, uh, Ry Cooter sentence, that Robert Johnson, when he recorded uh, the material that we've listened to, um, was facing uh, the, uh, the, well, it would be here, was facing inward right here in the, in the corner. And the microphone was behind him, all right? Behind him. I'll talk more about that. I think he was sitting in the corner to achieve a certain sound he liked. He wants to hear Wang. He wants to hear Wang. And then he goes on to explain what he means by Wang, which I think is a delightful phrase. He wants to hear that boosted mid-range. It's a great thing, because all of a sudden, the whole projection of the instrument has changed radically. Speaking of just the, uh, the guitar, obviously. Uh, a little bit more about those recording sessions to kind of locate us. The intimate zone immediately surrounding Robert Johnson's person conforms uh, to what has been called a territory of the self. A territory of the self. Um, uh, there, there are, a diff there are a different kinds of territories in cultural terms that are fixed. Um, and uh, the, the, the territory of the self means uh, to be brief, uh, commanding a certain kind of space. Um, so, in this sense, Robert Johnson's corner of the San Antonio hotel room where the recordings were made that we listened to falls primarily within the category of a well-bounded space to which individuals can lay temporary claim. This is very important. Possession being on an all or none basis. Um, examples might include a comfortable chair, a table with a view, you don't remember telephone booths, a theater seat. The point about these spaces that Echo and Reverb call stalls is that they provide easily defendable, I'm sorry, easily visible, defendable boundaries for a spatial claim, <clears throat> for a spatial claim. Um, there's a distinguishing characteristic here regarding these kinds of spaces. Now remember, <clears throat> we're referring to them as sound spaces. Um, unlike a, a, a highly personal place, these uh, spaces, uh, or stalls as they are referred to sometimes, can be uh, shared. Really uh, did not want to share his music with anyone um, because he had s s traded his soul to the devil in order to play this kind of music. You've heard this, I've said it in just about all my classes for one reason or another. But uh, uh, we're not dealing with it uh, as part of this class, but what we're dealing with is that Robert Johnson would, uh, according to um, uh, uh, sources that um, are, are reliable, uh, for a live performance, take the same position he took in the, in the hotel room uh, with his back to the audience. Probably, may I please be uh, a, a bit scientific, probably, rather than explain what he was doing, it would be easier to say, I don't want you to you know, uh, be able to play the way I do. He, he would often say, and this is very reliable, there are very reliable sources, that he didn't want anybody to see him play because he was afraid, because he made a living by playing. Uh, he didn't want anybody to learn his style. Didn't want anybody to learn his style. Yeah? I find that really interesting because he, I feel like his guitar playing really isn't all that unique. I don't think it but is either, but the sound of it is. Absolutely, well, yeah. I mean, it's um, uh, it's something that if you see somebody play, uh, it's it's not existing in the, the physical, tangible realm of 
than playing. Precisely. So therefore, when Robert Johnson is saying he didn't want anybody to learn his material, the definition I just gave, which would be he's a, a popular musician who's in competition, is probably wrong. And it's uh, probably also wrong that he would also say that, well, you don't want to learn how I play because I've traded my soul to the devil, in, in, in this case, the hotel. He needed to hear himself. Those of you who play, and I'm sure there are many of you here, know that if you can't hear yourself, you're dead in the water. You operate from muscle memory, and you always have a, a very uh, 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 disconcerting feeling that you rise above because you're a professional, and it tends to push you further, and you tend to just override. And people in the audience say, that was great, and you're thinking, you know, I have no way of knowing if that was or was not. Well, what Robert Johnson was doing was very consciously creating a sound space. Now, I'm meaning that only in the physical sense of the word. But uh, there are books written that cite uh, he's a competing musician, didn't want to share his work. And he would, I think, get sick of that and start to make this wonderful story up, which he did make up about um, uh, you don't want to suffer the same fate I suffer, which would really give him uh, a certain um, uh, a place in, in, in that very competitive world of getting a job in a juke joint and or playing on a street corner and having a tin cup out in front of you and getting money. And uh, the reports that I have read about street corner playing uh, also involve him with his back, sometimes with his back to so he could hear himself. So who is he playing for? The, the, the other in the, in the audience? Was he just simply a sound scientist and really uh, creating the, the ideal uh, uh, feedback loop? And by feedback loop, I don't mean feedback in terms of caterwauling. I mean you know, the ability to hear oneself. You know how good it is when you can hear how you sound as you're playing. And it's never what you hear played back or what other people hear. Um, I think he was a real smart character. And I think that um, he really knew what he was doing when he was creating a, a sound space for himself. Now let us not forget. Let us not forget we're dealing with a vernacular American music. We're dealing with music that um, had to invent itself. It had to invent itself. It had no past. This is one of the issues I have, and I'm all for uh, um, uh, deciphering the derivatives for Robert Johnson. There are so many. Um, there, his songs were almost um, the zeitgeist of what that uh, music should sound like. Uh, some scholars go after him for uh, taking from other artists, and I've mentioned many of them in here. Um, the one that comes forward in my mind right now is Petey Wheatstra, who performed as the Devil's Son-in-Law, or the High Sheriff of Hell. And yet when you listen to those records, uh, uh, which are available on obviously on CD, transferred uh, to CD. Um, sorry, the library does have them. Yeah, the yeah. library yeah. has a, a book on PD. Yes, yeah. so that's the only uh, one that it is, has ever been written. And there's, and there's a, a CD, CD with it too. Yeah, and that's the, the only recordings I've ever heard. Um, so PD Wheat Straws in the library, and you can listen, and if you listen, I brought some Sun House into play, because it's very different, and Robert Johnson was actually a, a disciple of Sun House, but with Sun House, you get a different kind of spatial uh, experience. Um, it doesn't sound unlike P.D. Wheatstraw, Scrapper, Blackwell, so many others. Anyway, I think Robert Johnson was extraordinarily conscious. Um, I'm not saying that uh, he took a high culture recording studio approach. I think that uh, he just knew the kind of space that he needed to uh, control and did so physically, and explained it in ways that uh, probably made as much sense to him as they would to uh, 
his PR agent if he had one. Um, rather than hearing from an audience member's point of view, the microphone is picking up something near Johnson's own horror-loading oral experience of himself. As much as it stands in for an imagined physical listener, and this is what's really so important to us, as much as it stands in for an imagined physical listener, an addressee, the mic is standing in for Johnson himself. What a remarkably insightful statement. I think that uh, uh, not only affirms but destroys the eavesdropping. Yeah, it does. It almost says that he's playing for himself, which, you know, um, I've, I've been imagining that, you know, uh, in performance, he, he's not facing the audience, so the audience is forced to eavesdrop. And then uh, when he's facing the corner to record, uh, he's um, forcing them to realize that um, he doesn't want them to eavesdrop, but he does. Let's be sophisticated critics as, as you have just been. This is totally subjective. Obviously, Robert Johnson had heard these devices that we have uh, spoken of. He's, he traveled through cities where one could put a nickel in the slot and hear a streetcar and so forth and so on. Um, what you just said, I need to clarify before I go further. Um, did you say that he uh, destroyed that space? or moved it? I originally said uh, destruction. Yes, you did. Um, did he deconstruct it instead of destroy yeah. it? Yeah, he deconstructed it. He deconstructed it. Now, this is where we're going to be very subjective, all right? Very subjective. We're sitting outside of academia at this point. Uh, and we're speculating. Uh, do you think he knew what he was doing? That's a very important question, and it's inappropriate for academia. It's totally inappropriate. I am perfectly aware of that. But I am wanting to start there because I want you to think about uh, this huge issue that has to do with this kind of music going from low to high culture in the 60s. Isn't that, those of you who've had other classes uh, from me, you know, I mean, isn't that one of the things that I say and have said all along? And uh, I'm not uh, changing that. But if Robert Johnson was deconstructing that space at the time of his recordings, doesn't that mean that it's moving from low to high culture in the 30s? <clears throat> a more real space. But uh, there's another part to this. Yeah. I hope uh, about uh, steering this in an unscholarly direction. Well, I already started that. Um, I think that uh, um, uh, he. The, this phrase that I came up with was uh, artistic consciousness nestled in collective unconsciousness, um, where he is uh, um, um, conscious of what he's not doing. Yes. Now, that is not subjective. Uh, to say that Robert Johnson is conscious of what he's not doing uh, it is not subject, subjective at all. It's a perfectly reasonable uh, critical distance uh, vocabulary. Uh, I don't want to get into, are we dealing with a savant here? Are we dealing with someone who's, uh, you know, really uh, ahead of his time? You know, I, I, I don't know. But I'm, I think we're dealing with someone who heard something. I think who heard something. Who, who, who couldn't explain it. And that's really a, a, a smart thing to say because he does arrange his material differently. He arranges it differently. And therefore, if uh, we were all writing a book, now we would have copious footnotes regarding why. All right? And it's almost, he almost exclusively arranges. He's an arranger. 
he's, in my mind, a total outsider from the rest of the blues performers. Damn material. Now we've just gotten rid of all of the fears and worries about, ooh, but Robert Johnson took the song, this part from that person. He was an outsider arranger of extant material. He also really knew about recordings. He knew about uh, making recordings. Uh, that was an aspiration of his. That was an aspiration. You know, I have to give you a piece of anecdotal oral history that doesn't <coughs> exist in a book, and that comes from Hubert Sumlin. Hubert Sumlin, Holland Wolf's guitar player. I brought him up uh, two or three times. Um, and uh, he played in my rock and roll history class, and, and just, you know, uh, at one point, we just sat down in front of the class and, and talked. And he, he talked about, uh, 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 he grew up in the same area as Robert Johnson and Charlie Patton. He talked about seeing uh, Charlie Patton. He never saw Robert Johnson. Oh. He never saw he never saw Robert Johnson, but he said everyone was talking about him. Now, her, her, Hubert is. Uh, uh, we got to remember that we're talking about oral history. We're talking, and by the way, it's important to relate context. Nobody in that class really had any reverence for Charlie Patton. There would be no reason for Hubert to say that in that class. It's two, 250 freshmen, you know, it's, you know what I'm trying to say. He wouldn't, he wouldn't want to impress anyone. And so it was something that uh, just was mentioned. He said he saw Charlie Patton. He never saw Robert Johnson. But he said everyone was talking. Everyone was talking. And you know, to, to me, that kind of added up to um, uh, uh, a place that Robert Johnson uh, occupied. And it, it's perfectly, <clears throat> your phraseology is just dropped dead right. Uh, it, it's, he's, this is the essential business. And, and this leads us right into uh, this very important book which I was talking about yesterday this portal yesterday I was talking about into cultural uh, elements and the whole role of the hipster or outsider. We're, we're, we're trying to slip that way. And I think that you know what you said uh, has all to do with what we are talking about. I, everyone uh, is worrying about, you know, what is it that he's doing? But the, the whole use of the recording space has all to do with how he arranged his songs. Phantasmagoria of selling one's soul to the devil to play this. I like that because I'm, a, you know, there's a poetic side of it. In this, in this analogy, uh, Robert Johnson would be ushering in a new era, yes. right? But Bach and Prince were ending, ending eras, right? No, I think uh, Robert Johnson was ending an era. Well, uh, then you wouldn't have said rock and roll. But I, you know, what you're saying, Carl, is important. I, I, I lost track. I didn't say rock and roll. What did you say? I said oh, like like a harder electric sound. Yeah. Okay. Being you know the like Chicago. Sorry. Yeah, I just jumped. Um, uh, the you did, Carl. He did say you did say ending an era. Yes. Yes, I heard you say that. I mean, it's. it's but like when you end an era, built into that ending. Uh, is the uh, retooling for something new? All, I mean, that's what's so. It's it's the transition, right? You, I mean, you close the, and I like your analogies. Uh, I'm sorry, not your analogies, but your your use of other figures. He did say ending an era. I jumped to rock and roll, but what you're you're, you're saying is an amplified, more hard, a harder sound. Let's not even talk about the musical genre. But it was ending an era, right? But what I'm saying, and I'm sorry if I was unclear, I wasn't as clear as Brian. In the ending of something, when you slam something shut, something else starts. I mean, just think about sound. Think about sound. 
I mean, you know, I'm talking about ending an era. Listen to the space. Hear that little moment of space? There's nothing there. Well, that's where something new, new begins. And so that's why Robert Johnson is such a transitional figure and why, uh, the, why it's perfectly justified uh, to hear him in this very postmodernist way. Um, outsider arrangement of extant material in Robert Johnson um, that I don't, I, I just refuse to get involved with the um, song history debate. Uh, that's a different class. Uh, a different class is looking at where um, uh, a Robert Johnson song really does come from. It comes from other, you know, other sources. He he, do, he doesn't spontaneously, you know, make all this stuff up in the studio. He's using other people's materials, but he's reshuffling them, as did Bob Dylan do in the early '60s and mid '60s. And there are some people who just do that. They just do that. And I think that with Robert Johnson, we've got the additional uh, attribute that is all about this class, which is that he used the, um, the idea of having a recording being something that you know, you're, you're, you're overhearing. And he did it in such a way uh, as to, to, to really um, I, well, I just can't get away from that. Collapsing the idiom uh, uh, into itself and sweep everything in, into uh, what he did to the extent that following it, um, well, it wouldn't happen the next month, the next year. Uh, in fact, it took decades to really recognize literally what was going on. But it happened also, let us not forget, with uh, a lot of material that I have queued up here that um, that uh, uh, creates something that Robert Johnson also does, which is a very, 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 very private self experience that we overhear. We're not interested in the narration. We're not interested in the narrative. That's a different class. We're not interested in song genealogy. That's a different class. What we're interested in is the, the uh, cultural verisimilitude that uh, certain sound recordings have created that lead to um, uh, um, the creation of persona that can only be uh, put into uh, uh, a, a medium that contains sound. I don't want to talk about iPods. And all that stuff until later on. We, we've had a couple of interesting things to say about it. We don't need to think about that. We just need to think about um, the 78 RPM record era, which is what we're going to do, which is what we're going to hear, except on CDs, um, uh, on Friday. Yeah. Okay. To quote other comments. I thought really some good insights as to as to as to what we're what, what we're dealing with. If if there were no music, this is an interesting. Uh, discussion relative to how it was recorded. Uh, for example, uh, Howlin' Wolf did all of his recording in studios. I mean, with guys running around operating equipment, getting everything right. Sun House has recorded both uh, commercial, uh, commercially, uh, uh, regionally, but also caught on, um, um, caught on a uh, a field recordist's machine. So we've got a couple of, and then we have a third generation of Sun House in the 60s. Interesting. So too with Howlin' Wolf. Robert Johnson, and maybe, is this the James Dean effect? You know, he was here and gone. Is, is, does this, I think it does contribute. I really do.